All right. Welcome to 2018. Welcome to the first Sunday of uh, the 52 Sundays that we get in 2018. And I'm really excited because uh, this morning we're starting uh, a new series. We're starting a new book. We're starting the book of Nehemiah. And um, if you have a white Bible or uh, you're looking for it, it's on page 955 in the white Bibles. Um, but if you don't, that's fine. It's too late for that, I guess. Um, but sure, we'll be, we'll be looking at uh, the book of uh, Nehemiah. Now, I know there's um, a couple different ways to pronounce uh, the, the title character um, in this book. Um, there's the American way, um, Nehemiah. There's the Irish way, Nehemiah. And then there's the proper way, which is some Hebrew thing that we can't even mess around with. So I'm going to be try- I'll probably go- be going back and forth. Um, with Nehemiah and Nehemiah. So please just forgive. Don't be like, wait, who's this guy? Who's Nehemiah? (laughs) Anyway, so we'll be looking at this new, um, I guess, event, this new book. Um, I'm super excited. It's been, for me, um, uh, a book that I dip into uh, that is encouraging. Um, I I like it so much. Um, It has to do with, um, yeah, setting goals. It has to do with Uh, making plans and seeing those goals and plans uh, come to fruition. And so while our resolutions are still um, in living memory, isn't this a good time uh, to look at that, uh, to see uh, a man by the name of Nehemiah, um, who is a man of, listen up, of prayer, of planning, of priorities, and persistence. Took me a while to think of all those. (laughs) Prayer, planning, priorities, and persistence. Uh, But as we look at uh, one, chapter one, verse one, we see that Nehemiah is in a bit of a pickle because he lives in Persia and he wants to be in the promised land. (laughs) So... He's in a pickle because he lives in Persia, but his heart is in the promised (laughs) land. I could do this all day. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so that's that's kind of the setting. Uh, Let's pray and then look at some of the who, what, when, where, why. And and then I think there's some really encouraging stuff in there um, regarding, I guess, uh, God's heart and, and how we join our little hearts uh, with God's big hearts. So let's pray. Um, Father, we're thankful that, you know, um, we're here, that we made it to 2018. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't waste it. Um, I hope that all of us um, see the end of this year, Lord, but I pray that every week, that every day, that even every hour of this um, time that you've given us, that you'd allow us to, to make them count. Um, please help us to be people of priorities. Help us to um, be, be men and women of prayer. Um, help us to learn from our older brother, uh, Nehemiah, uh, this Sunday and these coming Sundays. Um, help us, I pray. Um, Holy Spirit, would you, would you do your thing? Um, would you just enliven scripture? Would you open hearts and apply truth? Um, would you go beyond what myself or any preacher is able to do? Would you put eternal truth into our hearts? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So uh, if we look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we're going to see there's this interesting um, overlap of Hebrew names and Persian locations. Uh, the words of Nehemiah, the sons of Hakaliah. Um, So it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital city. Uh, So Nehemiah, Nehemiah, it's a a Jewish name. It means um, the bringer of God's comfort. Uh, Nahum means comfort. Uh, Perhaps you've heard of uh, the minor prophet by the name of Nahum or the city of Kapur Nahum, uh, the city of comfort. Um, Nehemiah means um, the comfort that comes from God. Uh, His father is named Hakaliah. We don't know anything about 
uh, his father, we know that he had a son by the name of Nehemiah. And so it's a Jewish name, a Jewish man from a Jewish father. It's in the month of Chislev, uh, which is a Jewish reckoning of time. Uh, they didn't use the 12-month calendar that we've adopted. They have their own. It's uh, about December uh, at this time. So it's, it's cold. Not as cold as we are because they're in Persia. Um, they're in the Middle East. But it's in the cold time of year. Um, and so in this uh, Jewish man from a Jewish father uh, in the Jewish month of Chislev, we see that it's the 20th year. That's an unusual way of reckoning time. And it has to do with the Persian emperor, um, the Persian empire. That means that King Artaxerxes had been reigning over the Persian empire for 20 years. And so what they would do is they would basically restart the calendar every time there was a new king. And they would measure everything based on how long this king has been the ruler over this uh, region or this empire. And then it says they're in the capital city of Susa. And maybe we're used to opening the Bible and reading about capital cities being Jerusalem or something. But here, this is one of, one of the capitals in the Persian Empire. There was a summer capital and there was a winter capital. And so we see that it's this, this Hebrew man in Persia. And like I said, he's in a pickle because he lives in Persia, but his heart is in the promised land. Um, let's talk about how he got there. And um, just give me a few minutes, okay? Um, some of you are really going to be dialed in. Some of you are real history buffs. And this is really going to scratch where you itch. Um, the rest of you, please be patient. Um, but listen in because this is going to just make sense of a lot of how the Old Testament works. Uh, give me a second. Okay, so... Uh, we see here, this is kind of the Old Testament um, on, a, on a chart, on a graph. Um, and we see that's Genesis, uh, that's Exodus. So the people of Israel, um, the, the family um, of the, the descendants of Abraham, they are slaves in a foreign empire. Uh, they are in Egypt serving a foreign king against their will. Okay? That's Egypt. Um, then... Uh, God raises up a rescuer, a leader, a deliverer. Um, this one is Moses. And he brings them out of foreign captivity and then brings them back uh, to the, the promised land, the land where uh, uh, Abraham started out, that's the pro or Abraham was promised, and they eventually go and they arrive uh, in the promised land. That's Joshua, uh, Judges, Ruth, etc. Um, they... They live there, and they have good years and bad years, and um, eventually uh, they establish a monarchy. Uh, they have a king. Uh, they choose uh, King Saul. That doesn't go that good. Um, God chooses King David. That goes pretty well. And then David's son Solomon takes over. That goes pretty well. But he didn't have, I guess, the best succession plan. Um, it went to uh, his son, I believe his name is Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, I guess, got some really bad advice about how to lead God's people um, rather than lead with kindness or grace or with a servant-hearted attitude. Um, he, he really um, looks to extract service from them, leads them cruelly, threatens them with violence, and uh, they're having none of that. And following uh, Rehoboam's very brief king, kingship, uh, there is like a, a split. There's a civil war. And the nation of Israel is divided uh, into two nations. Uh, there's the uh, upper kingdom, the northern kingdom, which uh, they get to keep the name Israel because they're bigger, I guess. And then there's this smaller, the southern kingdom, which takes the name uh, Judah, named after the largest of the tribes uh, in that region. And so from this point onward, as we go throughout the Old Testament, there's the northern kingdom of Israel and there's the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, a lot of our Old Testament takes place um, after this. So many, I think nearly, I think all of the prophets um, live and minister during this time period. 
um, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of the minor prophets as well, they lived during this time period. That's, that's when they did their thing. Um, and this eventually, there are, I guess, two different events that take place. In 722 BC, uh, the northern kingdom, uh, they fall. They are uh, conquered by the Assyrians, I believe, uh, and then they are uh, kind of dragged off into captivity. Um, so the northern tribe, they lose a series of battles, they lose a war, and then they are depopulated, taken away into captivity. And then the ruling um, Assyrian Empire, they had this policy of repopulation. So they took the land, um, that formerly belonged to Israel, and they imported um, other people, other settlers, to come and to take the land. They gave them the land for free. And so there was this intermarriage, intermingling, intertwining of even Jewish religious beliefs and then Assyrian and pagan stuff all mixed together. And so, as we arrive in the New Testament, there are these Samaritans that still live in the north. And so they're kind of half ethnically Jewish, half other stuff. And they have their own version of Judaism. And then as you come across the New Testament, um, there's always this disdain for them because they're settlers brought in from abroad and given um, their land. So that kind of makes maybe a little bit of sense as you encounter this prejudice against the Samaritans who live in the north. Um, and so when that took place, there was a lot of refugees that came from the northern kingdom down to the southern kingdom and kind of pled for refugee status. And the king, Hezekiah at the time, he allowed some of them to come into uh, Jerusalem. But then about 136 years later, then the Babylonian kingdom comes knocking and they win. Um, they go to war against the southern kingdom of Judah, and they win. And so it's the same type of thing where the people are deported, they're taken away, they're brought to Babylon. And so a lot of, I guess, the famous Bible stories that we would know, perhaps, about people like Daniel and the lion's den, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, Esther, um, there are all these stories that we know about, you know, Jewish men and women far from Israel. And have you ever wondered, like, how did they get there? Well, it's from these two invasions and these two deportations. And there is this hope and this longing. You know, some of them got on quite well um, in the foreign countries, like Daniel, Esther especially. They got on quite well living far from home, but there was this constant longing to get back there. Uh, there was a psalm that was written, written there, and it says that by the rivers of Babylon, you know, we, we sat down and we wept. Um, we couldn't play our harps any longer. We can't be happy. How could we be happy when we're so far away from our home? We don't belong here. That's what they're saying. And so there is this hope. And of course, I think, yeah, there's a, a 70s disco. Yeah, I don't, I don't like 70s disco, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, but so there's a, a, another version of that song that exists. Um, but so there is this longing for all these displaced people to, to come back. You know, they want to be a nation once again. Um, they're hoping to come back. It's not exactly the same. Um, they're, they're hoping to come back to the place where they feel that they belong. And so we see that there's this promise uh, Jeremiah and other prophets, they say, you know, God's going to do something. He is going to bring us back to the land. It's going to happen. And they're just like, we just don't know how. We don't understand. And I'm going a bit longer even than I planned on initially with this. But just for homework assignment, just jot down 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36 is a nice little summary that kind of explains how this captivity ended. There was a king by the name of Cyrus, and he says, you know what, if you want to, you can go back home. Just, you can go back home, and you can even rebuild your temples, and, and you tell you what, just pray for me, would you? And so he's this benevolent monarch who says, 
it's actually kind of unsustainable for us to feed and house and kind of enslave all of you. So you can go back to the promised land. And so it's kind of like the book of Exodus all over again. The people of Israel brought out of where they wanted to be, um, enslaved by a foreign king. And then we see that there's a leader that's raised up that brings them back, uh, back home to Israel. And so it was uh, Moses the first time. And then starting with um, Cyrus's decree, we see that there's a man called Zerubbabel who takes people and leads them back to Israel. Um, he was a, a builder and he was there and he said, you know, we have to rebuild the temple. The temple was destroyed. And so the first priority was to rebuild uh, the temple. And so what they did is they, of course, they laid the foundation first. They cleared away all the rubble, they laid a new foundation, and they had kind of this celebration party um, to say, okay, the first step is finished, the most important part is done, we're going to have a temple again. And they have musicians, and we can read about this in um, Ezra chapter 3, where they celebrate, we're back, our temple's coming back. And there's songs and there's celebration, but there's this, this interesting verse in verse 12 that says that while there's the singing and while there's the dedication of this new um, foundation stone for the new temple, it says that the older people are weeping and the younger people are cheering. And the implication is that those that were old enough to have seen the temple back before it was destroyed, they say, you know what, this is, this is nothing compared to what we used to have. We came all the way back for this? And then there's the younger generation that was probably born in captivity, and what they see is they see possibility. They say, we came back for this. And they're excited about it. And verse 12 of Ezra 3, it says that the noise mingles together. The celebration and the grieving mingles together into this one sound. Again, as, as one generation is bemoaning the past, and the next generation is excited for the future. And so that's kind of something that, as we're looking at the book of Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah is someone who's looking towards the future. He's building, we're call, calling this series building towards our future. So, and it's not an age thing. I'm not saying, well, old people are bad and young people are good. Young people can be idiots sometimes. Um, and I want to respect my elders. But, um, <laughs> but no, it's not, a, it's not an age thing um, at all. But we see that some people have just kind of a, a nostalgia that is not excited about the next thing. And, and other people, like Nehemiah, have this forward-thinking, opportunity-mindedness to say, how can we build towards our future? And so Zerubbabel was kind of the first one to lead the people out of captivity back into the Promised Land. And then a little bit later on, a second person, Ezra, said, you know what? They need help. We need more. And so the temple was being built, um, but Ezra, he was this um, Bible teacher, this real Bible nerd, like Shane England, if, if you remember him, um, just this like huge, giant brain nerd <laughs> about the Bible and just really wants people to, to know the scriptures. And so the second wave of like repatriate, pa, pa, repopulation, um, repatriatism, patriot. The second wave comes of repatronized people, and it's led this time by this a scribe. He's trained in understanding the Bible, and, and he's saying, you know what? It's not enough that they just have a temple. It's not enough that they just, they just have religious symbols. They need to know God's word. It's not enough to just they have a church building. They need to know the scriptures. The Bible needs to be open and taught. And so he comes, he brings a bunch of Levites with him, and then they come back. And that's the second wave of repatriation. And so now we come to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1, and he's going to be the man that God uses to bring the third wave back, okay? Thank you for bearing with me. Um, I think it's important. Um, it helps make the Bible make a bit more sense. So now this is maybe 15 years or so after Ezra has come back. So now they have a temple. Now they have priests and a Bible teacher 
But Nehemiah asks the question, well, how's like the rest of the city? I'm glad that they have like these really like, you know, impactful um, worship services, but how's the city? How's the rest of life? And so for that, we turn to uh, verse two. All that was verse one, but the pace is going to be picked up, don't you? <laughs> don't worry. It's, it's like we're jumping from like the book of Acts to Christmas to now, to now this. So a, fi- a final thought before we, we actually get into verse two. In our Bibles, um, the book of Nehemiah is like in the middle of the Old Testament. It's, it's before Psalms. It's, it's right there in the middle of the Old Testament. But, but we should know that it's like the very end of Old Testament history. Like, in fact, it should be right there, like, about the same time as Malachi. It's one of those very last events that take place in the history of Israel before those 400 years of silence. And that silence is broken by angels saying, you know, the Messiah, he's coming, you know. So this is kind of the last thing that takes place before everything goes quiet. So, it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, that I was in Susa, and then Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So he hears that they've just come back from, you know, the old sod, and he says, how is everything. He initiates the conversation. He says, how are the people doing? How is the city doing? His heart is heavy for a population that he doesn't know. And his heart is heavy for a city that it's very probable that he never went to. But, but he cares. And then in verse 3, the answer comes and says, Well, the remnant is in the province who survived the exile. They are in great trouble and in shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Zerubbabel brought people. Ezra brought people. It seems that the temple itself... Um, attention went towards that. Obviously, housing and lodging for the two waves of repatriation that went there, um, they're looked after. But on a whole, the city is quite vulnerable. Uh, it says that there is, um, the, the walls are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Um, in the ancient world, walls are quite important for a city. Um, just to refer you to another um, Old Testament story. I mean, do you remember the story about Joshua and the battle of Jericho? Um, they, what was the decisive moment in that battle? It was when the walls came crumbling down. And a city without walls is as good as dead, you know? And so the battle is won as soon as the walls came down. And then now we jump to, to this story and we see that Jerusalem haven't had walls in, in decades, in decades and decades. And so they're just sitting ducks. And so good job that there's religious renewal going on in the inside, but they're so vulnerable. And so in the ancient world, you know, a wall around a city is very important. Let me just address two elephants in the room just once and then, and then ignore them. Um, this is not a sermon nor a series about President Trump's um, plan to build a wall on the southern U.S. border. There's going to be no comments about that. This is, uh, predates those walls. And then the second thing is this has nothing to do with the plans to build walls around the River Lee as flood protection. And I know that there's all kinds of strong feelings uh, in our city uh, about whether those walls should be there or should not be there. I'm just going to address that and say that's not what this, this is not like a secret sermon about flood protection or immigration. But this is Nehemiah's heart that is like, that's just not right. That shouldn't be. So they repopulated it, but they're so, so vulnerable. 
And, and it says that the walls had crumbled down and the gates have been burned with fire. Over my, little, my, my Christmas break, um, I read a book um, about the burning of cork um, that took place in, in December of 1920. And um, I was reading about that, and it is just so interesting to see what a campaign of deliberate arson can do to just destroy a city. And so it says that the gates have been burned with fire, that there's this purposeful just decimation or destruction of the city. And so as he hears that the walls are gone, the gates are burnt, they're just sitting there so vulnerable, verse 4 is his response. And it, he doesn't just, you know, tut. He's not just like, ah, oh, bless, or ah, oh, that's terrible. He doesn't shrug, but his response is, is quite emotional. And so I have a question for you, and this is a little bit interactive. The question is, do you cry during films? And what's the last film that you've cried at? Don't tell me. Tell someone sitting next to you. What's the last time you've cried at a film? Okay. Now, now, who wants who wants to rat out their neighbor? What's what's a good what's a good one? <laughs> Christmas vacation. Yeah. Okay. 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 So tears of laughter. Anything? Huh? Okay, well, we can't. <laughs> Polar Express, okay. Yeah, yeah, Polar Express is one. Um, frozen, I kind of, <laughs> just, just a little bit, just got that lump for Frozen. Um, but, but my last, like, I think real cry in a film was actually um, Dunkirk. Um, I, I, I can ruin the ending because it's history, but like when they're in the train at the end, when they've made it, and then there's this like overwhelming sense of just like, everyone's just like shame, like, ugh, like we, we didn't do what we're supposed to do. And they just are feeling all this shame. And then when like they, they get the news that people are just, they're just glad they made it. And they're just, they're celebrating their return. I'm just like, oh. Anyway, so. So now, like, another question, and, and we're not going to, this is not a tell your neighbor um, type of question, but, like, but when's the last time you cried, like, for your circumstances? Um, not, it, not just, maybe it's almost easier to cry for a film, um, because it's there and there's music, but, like, but for a real life thing. We think about our own situations, our, our lives, that it's hard and it's not getting easier. And then, like, a third question is, like, who among us, or have you cried for somebody else? So maybe it's easy to cry for a film, you know, and then also maybe for ourselves, but then to cry because of somebody else. It's, it's a deep expression of, of love, that you, you hear news about somebody that you care about, and it, it moves you to tears, when you hear that things are not well with them. You know, sometimes maybe our, our legs give out and we're not able to stand anymore. Verse 4 says, I sat down and wept. Nehemiah is doing what perhaps some of us have been, where we've been moved with compassion. Uh, the word passion, perhaps you're familiar with it, it's a Latin word, it means, it means to suffer and calm means to suffer with. And so when we have compassion for somebody, it's as if we're suffering with them. We're not being hurt, but we suffer with them. You cry with them, or in Nehemiah's case, you cry for them. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. 
And I continued fasting and praying before the Lord of heaven. Again, Nehemiah has likely never been to this city in his life. He doesn't know the people, but he knows that this city, it plays this crucial role in the plan of God for the nations. He knows this is not just a humanitarian crisis. This is like a theological disaster. <laughs> He's thinking like, okay, how, how, how could God let this happen? And then maybe thinking, well, God promised he's going to send a savior to the world. He promised he's going to bless all the nations through us. But, but how is he going to bless the world and save the world through us if the people are scattered and if the city is shattered? How can God bring grace to this world in a city and a people who are so full of disgrace? And so as he's, as he's there feeling that, that humanitarian crisis, which turns into, for him, just this theological crisis as well, it, it's not hard for us to jump from 445 B.C. in Persia to 2018 in Cork. We don't have the exact layers of theological significance um, about uh, our city and uh, the country that, that we live in, but... Wouldn't you say that we have grounds for being like just as heartbroken as he? Uh, Cork is a city of, of great beauty. And I and everyone else, like we're quick to say, I love this place. Like I love this city. Like I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could, you know? And I haven't left. It's a, it's a great city to, to love. And it's full of people who love this great city. Uh, but, you know, like a bad paint job, you know, you could just scratch off one layer of paint and you see that we have grounds for being just as heartbroken about our city. Uh, some of them are just very generic problems that the cities of the world all suffer with. You know, a, a, an increasing homeless uh, population that maybe is made more acutely visible uh, during the winter months. Um, some would say a lack of adequate health care for the poor, um, shockingly high rates of domestic abuse, shockingly high rates of institutional abuse, um, and addictions to drink and to drugs that are out of proportion, a suicide epidemic amongst our young men. Um, and then in addition to that, many of which are common problems for the cities of the world, uh, there's just nearly a wholesale ignorance and or rejection of the life-changing and soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, a recent study came out by Barna Institute called Finding Faith in Ireland, um, it's a, a long-term study based on the religious beliefs of the youth uh, under 22, I think, of Ireland. And it just, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of stats or details. Also, I, I left the book at home, so. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's, it's as you would expect. It is um, just so much um, misconceptions or ignorance about the most basic teachings uh, of the Bible um, a rejection or an unwillingness to consider um, faith or discipleship in Jesus Christ. The old statistics would say that there's a 1% to 2% um, of our city and this country that would say that, that they would have a, a life-saving, life-changing relationship with Jesus. And not everyone who says it, it even is true. And so there's this shockingly low rate of people that would say that they have this vital relationship with Jesus. So the days of kind of on Gortamor or the Great Famine, they're over, but it seems that there is this famine of hearing the word of God. And would you consider like asking God to move our heart for our country, for our city? 
to, to move us in kind of a, a Nehemiah-like direction of feeling what God feels for our city and for our county. Allow me just to read one verse from a psalm. Psalm 119, 136 says, My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. The psalmist says, I I cry because people don't keep God's law. Nehemiah says, I hear that these people, they're in disgrace. And it says that he sits down and he weeps and mourns and fasts and enters into uh, an extended season of prayer and fasting. He heard of the disgrace, and so he prayed, and then he acts. And his actions are the whole rest of this book. Uh, Paul, in the, book of Ath- in the book of Acts, he goes to the city of Athens, and it says that he looks around, and there's, there's these idols There's these statues that people are worshiping all over the place. And it says that his spirit was provoked and it moved him towards action. Uh, Jesus himself, uh, he knew the rejection that the city of Jerusalem typified and then was going to enact. And in Luke 19, it says that, that he weeps over Jerusalem. The same Jerusalem that Nehemiah is weeping over and is going to eventually rebuild, um, the Lord Jesus looks at and weeps for and says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But then he acts. He goes down into the city. He teaches them. He serves them. He calls them to belief. And then he dies for them and raises for them. So Nehemiah hears, he cares, and he prays. He cares, so he prays. Picking up the pace, it says that I continue to pray. This is not just a one-off. This is a a season of prayer and prayerfulness that he begins uh, in this month. It says that chapter 1 takes place in the month of Chislev, and then... We're certainly not going to get to it today, but in chapter 2, it says it's the month of Nisan. And that's about three months apart um, before it seems that he gets an answer towards his prayer. And so he hears news that impacts him emotionally. And then because of that, he prays and prays and prays and prays. And then there's this breakthrough that takes place months afterwards. And if we had more time, if we had more time, it'd be great to spend a whole week on looking at his prayer. Maybe we will, but let me, in case we don't, <laughs> here's, just, here's just the highlights. There's no clock there, so I'm like, I got all the time in the world, but I know that I don't have all the time in the world. <laughs> in verse 5, it says that like, he is addressing God. He begins by saying, God, you are great and you are mighty. You're the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallowed be your name. He begins by saying, God, you are so big. And then in verse 6 and 7, he then moves on to this confession of his and his people's sins. Forgive us our trespasses, he says. He acknowledges how great God is, an exalted view of God, as Alex said to us at the beginning of the service. And then having an exalted view of God gives him a realistic view of himself, saying, man, you know, we fall short. I fall short. I come from a generation of people that fall short. We've messed up. And then in 8 to 10, he makes his request. You know, give us this day our land back. Give us this day 
a freedom from the Persian Empire. We'll read that. Remember the word that you commanded to your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you amongst the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I'll gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen, and I will make my name dwell there. So he's quoting Deuteronomy, and he's saying, you know what, God, I I get it. It says in your word that if your people are disobedient, that we'll be vomited out, we'll be scattered from the promised land and sent to all the nations. And he's saying, you know what, God, you were right. You kept your promise. We have been disobedient, and now we're in Persia. My cousin is in Babylon. You know, we're scattered all over the place. You are right. But he says, but God, it also says that if we turn to you, that if we have this heart of longing for obedience, that you'll gather us back. He says, God, I've seen you bring the first part true. I'm asking you, would you bring the second part true as well? He lays hold of the promise of God. He's like a, like a pit bull with a boat, just, just like grabbing it and shaking it and saying like, but you said, you said it, and you're, you're true and you're right, and I'm claiming the second part too. I'm asking for that second part as well. Would you bring us home? You faithfully sent us out. I'm asking, would you faithfully draw us, gather us back together? And then he brings it from there. He moves on to say, and you know what? Would you give me um, favor in the eyes of my boss? of King Artaxerxes, because we'll find out in the next chapter that he works for him, and, and help me to work, to, to bring this to my boss in a way that's going to cause your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so as we, as we conclude, as we wrap this up, as we finish, I, I love this heart of compassion that moves him towards an extended season of heartfelt prayer. It's, it's, it's three months of prayer, you know, so it could be, you know, 100 days, 110 days or so, depending on how they, they reckon those days or what time in the month it was. But he prays for, let's say, 100 plus days that God would do something. And then, if you're familiar with the story at all, you know that he will. And that he's going to use Nehemiah to do it. And then in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 12, it says that the walls are rebuilt. And they do it in 52 days. It's this incredible around-the-clock building project where in about 50 days, they rebuild everything. And it was preceded by about 100 days of focused prayer. Now, I'm not that good at math, but like, what's that ratio? It's like a two-to-one ratio that he prays twice as long as he works and then achieves what they thought was impossible to do. And so it's just such a a fantastic thing to think about of, I guess, the, the power of prayer and even the limitations of our ability. We tend to underestimate prayer and overestimate how much we can do in our own strength. Um, Nehemiah said, you know what? Before anything, before any plan is drawn up, we just need to pray. And so he prays long, prays strong, and then gets done in less time than what he prayed, what he could have taken years or decades, perhaps, to get done. Um, There's my favorite quote from Abraham Lincoln, uh, one of the good American presidents. Um, He said that if he had an hour to chop down a tree, he would spend the first 50 minutes sharpening his axe and the last 10 minutes swinging away at it. And it's not a direct parallel to prayer um, and to work, but saying, you know what, rather than expend a bunch of energy just whacking some tree with a dull axe, he said it's worth it to, to, you know, as one of the Psalms say, unless the Lord builds the house, the workmen, the laborers, they labor in vain. I don't want to labor in vain. I want to spend time doing the preparatory work. Uh, Martin Luther is credited as saying, you know, he had a a quite a busy schedule. And he said he was going to bed early one day. And they said, why are you going to bed so early, Marty? And he says, well, you know what? I have such a busy day tomorrow. And he rattled off all this stuff that he had to do the next day. He says, I have so much stuff to do. I'm going to need to pray for at least two hours 
before I start my day because I have so much to do. Sounds so counterintuitive. I have a lot to do, so I'll skip prayer. I have a lot to do, so I need to sharpen my axe before I get to work. So in our passage today in chapter 1, we see a, a man that was moved with compassion. He heard about the state of affairs of other people that was bad. And so he makes plans to leave the palace and to travel and to risk his life for their betterment. And that's great. But as we conclude, just to remind you that our Lord Jesus Christ was moved with compassion for you when he heard your sorry state of affairs. Not just disgraced, but defamed, doomed, dead spiritually. And so Jesus leaves the palace. He leaves the right hand of the king. And he doesn't travel 800 miles from, Pers from Susa down to Jerusalem, but the infinity between heaven and earth. And he didn't just risk his life heading into a conflict zone, but he gave his life for us. And so as we consider that sacrificial, heart-motivated love of our Lord Jesus for us, I think that's going to be kind of the motive that causes us to have a heart motivation towards the people that we love in our city as well. So the love of, we are, we are people who have been cried over and loved and rescued. And now we're called to be those that perhaps would cry over and love the people of our city, the people in our lives. So let's pray.